welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend and give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. All right, it's kind of a weird vibe here at Stately Virtual Memories Manor right now. Um, there is a medical emergency in my wife's family, so she had to fly down to Louisiana on Saturday. The situation is improving, knock wood, and she's hoping to get home later this week. But for now, it's just me and our greyhound, Bendico, going slowly insane. I mean, Benny's the one going insane, not not me. I'm just taking care of things I've put off for a while, like cleaning up the garage, doing our taxes, figuring out how to retire to Stockholm and design a currency for dogs and cats to use. And Well, still, it's kind of weird being here by myself. Um, my job doesn't involve coworkers, although I do get calls periodically. Um, and I know this job takes me away uh, from home a bunch of times a year, but... Unlike me, my wife has friends in the neighborhood and in general, uh, so she can always talk to other people. (laughs) For me, I've got the podcast, and it's sort of like having friends, albeit in small portions. This week, my guest and temporary pal is James Osland, author of the wonderful new memoir, Jimmy Neuroses, from Echo Press. James James has built a pretty amazing resume, which we'll go into in his bio, but Jimmy Neurosis covers an era long before that. It is about James's mid-teen years, like 14 to 17, covering 1977 to, to 1980. As the book begins, James's father has abandoned him and his mother in the Midwest, and they move to San Francisco to be close to his older sister. Um, James, like I say, is about 14, 15 years old when this starts, and He's gay, uh, not exactly out to his mother, and and he discovers solace of sorts in the punk rock community in San Francisco. Um, the book really captures the, the manic energy of the punk scene and James's emergence over those really critical three years of his life, uh, both as a gay man and as an artist. The thing is, it also captures just the awful domestic scenes of a single mother who's trying to keep her home together with no money and a son who is rebelling against everything because that's that's who he is at that time in his life and and at that moment in our history overall and to his credit James doesn't mask or justify any of that behavior and maybe I'm oversensitive because I remember what my mom's life was like after my old man moved out and the occasional missed child support payments and all the other the other aspects of shared experience we have. But I found those passages really affecting, on top of all of the other stuff that, that James brings to this book. On the other hand, 
I will admit, I had no direct ability to relate to the portions where an underaged James moves in with a much older man in New York for a few months. Um, we talk about that during the show, too. Jimmy Neuroses serves as a wonderful time capsule uh, of the late 70s, of of the punk scene, of of sexual self-discovery. And the writing isn't ornamental or or reflective of like contemporary James's perspective, but, but we get into why that's the case. Um, it's a really compelling book, and I, I hope you give Jimmy Neuroses a shot. Now, as caveats go, uh, we recorded in a hotel room in New York City, so there is some housekeeping noise outside the room, like a vacuum in the hallway that starts up a couple of times, including right at the end when we're just getting into a really good part. Also, each of us gets choked up at different points in this episode. Um, you'll understand when and why. And also, despite what you're about to hear in James's bio, there is virtually no talk about food until the end of our conversation. Here's James's bio. James Osland is the editor-in-chief of World Food, a book series launching from Penguin Random House in 2020. Prior to that, he was the editor-in-chief of Savor, America's most critically acclaimed food magazine. He has won multiple National Magazine and James Beard Foundation awards and has been a judge on Celebrity Apprentice, Iron Chef America, and all five seasons of Bravo's Top Chef Masters. He is also the author of Cradle of Flavor, Home Cooking from the Spice Islands of Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia, which was named one of the best books of 2006 by the New York Times and Good Morning America. He lives in Mexico City and New York City. His new book is Jimmy Neuroses, a memoir. And now, the virtual memories conversation with James Osland. Why did you want to tell this story? I suppose I primarily wanted to tell this story to make sense of it all for myself. Mm -hmm. The events that are described, written about in the book, um, you know, though the book only covers a three-year period, yeah. had been haunting me for literally decades wherever i was i could be out hiking in the desert i could be at the office in new york city and images and th memories images connected to and memories of the time covered in the book would just rise to the surface right right in front and right you know headlights in my consciousness and I suppose I needed to understand why that was the case. Mm -hmm. And at first, the instinct wasn't to write a book about those, about that time, but instead just to sort of study it, mm -hmm. you know, in my own mind. And what I realized after a number of years, and I, I think we're talking about 10 years, it came to me, oh, this might be a book. And so I lived with that idea for about two years. Maybe this is a book. Maybe, just maybe, this is a book. But I didn't know what kind of book, and I didn't know how it sounded, and I didn't know where the voice in that book was coming from. And gradually, and I couldn't exactly put my finger, finger on what moment or what the precise impetus was, I found the courage to really make a book out of all of that in my head. Yeah. And then um, came a proposal. And then came my agent uh, who, who gave me the courage <laughs> that I didn't necessarily have to um, go about literally creating a proposal. And then I went about doing it. And that was, that was instinct number one, yeah. you know, in the creation of, of Jimmy Neurosis, you know, really at the primal level. Beyond that, there 
was also very much inside of me um, hunger to to read in literature something that I've not read a lot about in literature, which is a gay young man's story, a teenager's story. Um, there is a lot of very excellent, some of it, in fact, enthralling gay literature throughout the ages. But I felt that the story that I wanted to bring to the page, hopefully knock on a lot of wood, would answer a need that, um, at least partly answer a need, I should say, um, for, for, for material about that, for a kind of documentation about what it's like to be a, a gay guy inside of a teenager's body. And, you know, it's like, it's about being a teenager plus plus, because you have a whole lot of other things going on that aren't necessarily connected to, you know, the vibrancy and extremeness of, of your teenage years. You've got something else in there. You've got the fact that at least when I was a teenager in the late 1970s, the, the period covered in the book, um, it wasn't necessarily being gay thought of as something that was particularly positive or liked yeah. by the culture around me. And I wanted to give readers an idea of what that felt like, because I, I thought that they could identify with it. And it's a particular cultural moment. Also, that very late 70s near San Francisco punk scene that you're we'll say your character, even though it's you, um, becomes immersed in. So it's it's there's a uniqueness to it. It's not simply a suburban teen. Absolutely. It was a, it was a kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe historians will, will think otherwise in, in 50 years or a hundred years. And I'm not talking necessarily about my book. I'm talking about that time period, mm -hmm. the 1970s in between the, the freewheeling sixties hippies, or at yeah. least the hippies, as we know how the, how the idea of hippiedom had, had entered mainstream consciousness. Um, so that's one layer of backdrop to Jimmy Neurosis. Another layer of backdrop is, you know, the fact that I had the odd fortune of being born and raised in San Francisco and the San Francisco Bay Area, a kind of epicenter of gay consciousness in the United States. There was, for all intents and purposes, this isn't this isn't hard science, but there was San Francisco and there was New York in the 1970s and 1980s, where a lot of gay people, men and women, moved to from around the country and even around the world to find out different things about themselves and not feel so uncomfortable. And at least as far as I know, that had never happened in human history before. And I had the strange, as I was saying, fortune of, of being in San Francisco in the middle of all of that and all that that meant. And, um, and that was a very interesting thing. Yeah. And you chronicle it really well in terms oh. of, well, again, it's, it's more welcoming and yet you're still facing queer bashing and, you know, insults as a kid and, and as hospitable as San Francisco was, it was still, you know, potentially lethal to be who you were. Well, in fact, you know, in spite of, you know, San Francisco's reputation in the late 1970s and early 1980s as being a kind of gay mecca, I mean, my personal experience was, was, <sighs> I shouldn't say it was entirely to the contrary, because in you know, San Francisco certainly wasn't rural Kansas. Yeah, you know, you didn't but, have it easier, but it was still tough. But it, in yeah. fact, it was really tough. And of the many schools that I went to as a kid growing up, my dad was an office product salesman, and we moved, oh, a lot before the time I was 14. I think, yeah, we moved seven times before the time I was 14. But by the time my mom and I ended up back in the San Francisco Bay Area, Area, we were, I was quite surprised to find out that like 
honestly, it was the roughest social environment. The high school that I went to in, in a sub suburban San Francisco town called San Carlos, it was the roughest social environment I'd ever encountered. I was brutalized. It was rough. And that's something that's, that's definitely recounted in the book. Mm -hmm. How did the book evolve over the once you began writing? I think I read that it went through multiple drafts to get where it was. How did it? What was it like in the beginning, and do you see it in, in the, this final form now? There were three major drafts mm -hmm. of the book um, over the course of eight years, and I guess you know I've I, I've never written a memoir before. In fact, you know, boy, that was a whole other can of worms. <laughs> was like the recognition that like wow, <laughs> writing a memoir. What am I doing? <laughs> And once I came to terms with that and all of all that that meant for me, um, the first draft really, I mean, man, the, it was a telephone book. Yeah. And it was basically every possible thing that I could think of during the timeline, the years that I decided that the book would discuss and I wrote it all down. And that took about a year and a half. It took, actually took a little bit longer than a year and a half. It was closer to two years. And then what I did after that was I let it sit on the shelf gathering dust for a period and had the somehow found the guts to look at it again and sat down like an editor and figured out, okay, what in here might someone, namely my hopefully dear reader want to read out of all of this what uh what story what's what story is fundamentally here what is the major narrative arc of this story and then also what what contributes to that narrative arc and so i sat down pretty scientifically and plucked out what i felt was were, were those things that i was just describing and wrote a second draft, which was very pared down. It was um, less than a third of the length of the the original. And then let that sit on the shelf for a while. And then I embarked on the, on the real and serious work of the third draft, which was hopefully, God willing, writing a book. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was a very other process. And in a way, now that I look at it in retrospect, it was a kind of merging of drafts one and drafts two and bringing in um, a lot of the emotional information that had been stripped of the second draft into the third draft. Um, you know, my hope is to was to create um, an entertaining read for the reader you know, and not write a memoir. I certainly couldn't, you know, use the act of writing a memoir as a kind of, you know, psychological process. <laughs> yeah. Although, of course, that was there during during the eight years that I worked on it. Did your magazine editing experience, that sort of storytelling, benefit you in the terms of, of editing a book? Or is it really a different beast? That's hard to say. I would suspect, by and large... Ultimately, it's a really different beast. Um, Some of the tools, I'm sure, are, are overlapping. But... Sure. I mean, I think of myself fundamentally. My, 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 my own self-identity is as a journalist. That's what I think of myself mm -hmm. as. And I suppose if I you know, put on the right pair of glasses, what I did during the eight years of writing Jimmy Neuroses was a kind of journalism, a sort of self-journalism. And so I definitely think, yeah, I think of myself as a journalist, first and foremost, someone who's always reporting, always trying to find out what's, what's beneath that layer that we think is the, is the final layer. i bet i bet i have a hunch there are a couple more layers yet to be found mm -hmm. in that sense yes my work as a journalist my work as a magazine editor did contribute to the process of writing jimmy neuroses however all that said nothing absolutely nothing in my creative life and all of the things that i've made in these now 56 years from 
being a filmmaker originally to a poet to somebody who takes pictures to somebody who worked in the movie business to somebody who was then a journalist and a, uh, a theater critic and so on and so forth. Nothing could have prepared me for the process of, of writing, writing this book. It was, it was, it challenged me in ways that I, <laughs> I could not have imagined possible before embarking on it. Mm -hmm. It's not just about you, but about your mother, mm -hmm. this book. Mm -hmm. And she died. My mom passed um, about 10 years ago. Okay, so she wasn't around. I, I was wondering if she knew about the genesis of this or would have seen an early draft or knew that you were working on something. She didn't. Okay. My father, however, did know about it. I yeah. had um, started working on it about a year and a half before he passed away. Mm -hmm. And... Um... Did it give you any, uh, don't paint me too bad a light, son. I did the best I could, that, that sort of thing. Or was he pretty accepting at that point that your take was going to be your take? My parents in their own funny way, and I mean, this is my perception. They, they if they were here in this room with us, might have completely different ideas. But um, it's my belief that my parents, both of them, were great seekers of the truth and um, my mom and my dad, um, and I think maybe I didn't realize this as clearly and vividly as I realize it now, and partly, you know, it could have been because of writing this book, but my mom and dad were great, great supporters of me mm -hmm. and of my sister as well. Yeah who is now my very, very close friend. You and mentioned in the acknowledgments, which I'm glad about because you were on terrible terms 30 years ago, 30, almost 40 years ago in, in the book. Yeah. You know, <laughs> life is like that. My, my sister and I had, um, you know, a kind of only limited knowledge of each other as, as we grew up because, well, frankly, there was, there was a lot of fuss and dysfunction in how, in how we grew up. Mm -hmm. And, what um, was the age gap, by the way, my sister is seven, seven years older. Okay, so that's, so it's, it's a good deal. Older. That adds to it too. Yeah, yeah. That adds to it too. But, um, over time we, we've become remarkably close. Well, and the only uh, two survivors of that family. Yes. That's, that's a yes. common. Yeah. Yes. Um, but are your parents, you were saying, um, in terms of being, Seekers or what you well, learned in the process. I'll tell you what. Yeah. My mom, at the same time as being a seeker, as I've termed it, and also so, so very supportive of me and my sister, um, she, she was also, as she, she would term it, a very private person. So she would <laughs> likely, um, in response to this book, her reaction would simply be, "Why, why, please, must you tell these things to to the to the outside world?" But I think she would understand why I f I felt compelled to explain these things to the outside world because it's my idea that some of the matters discussed discussed in this book might be very helpful for for a number of people who could use help. And I think if I explained that to my mom, she would um, not only give a green light to it, but also just really love, love and support what, what I was up to with it. In the book, there's a, an emotionally charged yet abortive coming out between you and your mother. I mean, it's there, but not there. Was there an explicit moment in, in between you? Parents are interesting. And <laughs> mothers in particular are interesting. And the relationships between mothers and sons, boy, is that a fascinating <laughs> thing. Yeah. And for for at least 100,000 reasons that I could, you know, sit, sit down a name and I won't. But I think that oftentimes my suspicion and at least as far as my relationship with my own mom goes and my, my memory of my own mom is that mothers know a lot more than they yeah. sometimes let on. 
Um, a certain kind of reader might read Jimmy Neuroses and think, oh, this, this poor teenager's mom is homophobic. My suspicion is my mom was not homophobic. In fact, never was she homophobic. Instead, my suspicion is that my mom was concerned that I might not have the proper footing in the world if I was gay and living the life of a gay person, mm. I think she was genuinely concerned that I might be disadvantaged because of that. And also the fact is, you know, my mom um, came from, you know, a time and place where homosexuality, where gayness was not something that was a part of the general fab fabric. One of the things... One of the things that Jimmy Neurosis is very much about is that it's my fundamental belief and a message that I really wanted to be infused into the book was that it's okay to be gay. It's okay. It's not that big a deal. There are gay people all over the world. There always have been. There always will be. The problem is, is when the culture runs into ideas surrounding something that is, in fact, very, very natural. I'm not saying it's commonplace. I don't know what the actual numbers are as far as the percentage of human beings in cultures worldwide that are gay, but it's there. It's, it's there everywhere. And that is absolutely one of my fundamental messages is that it's okay to be gay and it's also okay to be different. It's okay to be weird. It's okay. Look at me. I came out okay. I went on to be a magazine editor and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that possibly happened was possibly tied into not even possibly I would scratch that word. I would say definitely tied into those three turbulent years that are account account recounted in Jimmy Neuroses. Is it easier? I mean, you know, young gay people now, is it easier for the coming out living? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Absolutely. But I suspect you know, and it, it it depends, of course, where you're talking sure. about. Again, that, that little tiny town in, in Kansas or something might be a different... Absolutely, yeah. than the San Francisco Bay Area or Mexico City or Paris or London or wherever. However, all that said, all those disclaimers stated, it's by and large my belief that it probably is a little bit easier nowadays. There's, I, I do think that... The representation that is out there in the mass media and the way the ways in which, uh, for better and worse, we receive information these days, portrayals of gay people are are definitely it's definitely by and large gay people aren't portrayals of gay people aren't. The, the punchline or the doom to alcoholism and death is... That is we would say childhoods. find in the 1950s yeah. or in the yeah. 1960s in, in our culture. Mm -hmm. And and I think that partly, and many other things, does does make a difference. I think that, it, you you know, it's that, it's that thing about knowledge is power. And it's one of the reasons that I wrote this book, too, is to show what it feels like on the inside of all of that and to not tell it through the mind and experience of, of a 56 year old me, but instead really try and capture to bottle what it felt like then the urgency and franticness and extremeness and wonder and joy too of then as a teenager and to, well, it's actually something that occurs to me. It's very near the end of the book, not to give anything away, where the narrator kind of um, considers a sexual abundance of of some of those years and has a little, is this necessarily the best thing for me? You know, you know and, it's, and it's, I didn't know how much retrospective post-AIDS um, view that is or how much of that was you at, at 15, 16, 17 years old. That was me then yeah. that came to that thought, to that awareness. And I, I think what you're referring to, correct me if I'm wrong, is there's there's a moment toward the end of the book where the lead character, me, yeah. um, comments, well, he's become, let's just 
call a spade a spade, a sex addict in both New York City and in San Francisco. And man, those were those were the go go days to do I, such activities. I published Samuel Delaney's books exactly <laughs> based on Chip's descriptions of, of what life was like, even leading into the early eighties. It's like an alien planet to me. I sure. Like, but oh, before right. AIDS, it was like, hey, all bets are off. Let's yeah. go have a good time. And I think, you know, part of the reason for that now <laughs> with, you know, the 39,000 foot view of of retrospect of 40 years later is that, you know, a, a lot of people participating in that were coming from places like rural America or places where such ex such expressions of one's sexuality were not allowed. And there you have San Francisco, and there you have New York, and there you have Los Angeles and Miami too, and a little bit Chicago and Minneapolis, et cetera. And you've got a lot of people coming to those places who are expressing who they are through the sexual act. And I think what happened to me around age 17 toward the end of that was the idea that, hmm, that's great. And that's all in, all well and good. And I, and I, you know, I certainly have a, a, a grasp of, of, of what that means because I'm doing it. I'm, I was having sex right and left sometimes four or five times a day with four or five different partners at certain times. I think that what came to me, though, was, hmm, maybe there is a risk in finding one's identity exclusively through this, through one's sexuality. As I began to study myself, and, and hopefully that's what comes across in the book as well, there was the idea that my sexuality is but a part of this strange spectrum of things that I am comprised of. It does not define it. And that was the thought that came to my mind. And very much my intention as the writer of all of these memories was to not be seeing that and experiencing that as the person I am today, but instead be expressing that as the person I remember myself as. In fact, I spent, oh my goodness, probably the last eight months or so of the, of the creation of this book, scrubbing the book of any kind of thought or feeling that felt associated with me as an adult. Yeah, the, the lack of retrospection. I, I appreciate that. There was no... Nowadays, I understand who I was back then. You've really no, put it in the moment no, itself. And that's no, really compelling no. About it. I really wanted, as I was saying, to, to capture, to bottle the strange and fabulous vortex that I was living in then. You know, when you, teenage brain is a very specific thing. Teenage brain doesn't <laughs> sit here across from an interviewer like yourself and answer questions in the fashion that I'm doing now. This is 56-year-old me. 15-year-old mm. me? <laughs> very, very different man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very, very different creature altogether. <laughs> but one of the things I was, I was wondering, uh, and again, you... you at least the way the book is framed, it puts me in mind. I'd recorded with Edmund White just a, a couple of months ago, who's a hero, a personal hero, but who assumed, and, and again, coming from an earlier generation, assumed he would get married to a woman and that this would go away. And there's no sense of that from your narrative. Any, there's no fighting against being gay. It seems there's always, this is who I am. There, there's not a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm going to find a girl and that's going to cure me. There's no degree of that, that, you know, within the character's perspective. I'm strange that way. Yeah. Yeah. I've always had that, that I, I don't know if it's lucky or unlucky. It just is basically, but I never struggled with the idea of my own gayness. It mm. never felt odd or awkward or shameful or like something I needed to deny or push away. Yeah. Going back to the time I was roughly, well, I would say seven-ish, I knew 
And it's just the way it was, like in the same way that my eyes are brown yeah. and I was born in Mountain View, California. These are just, just facts. facts. These are just facts. What was different, you know, about being me being gay then was that I was aware that the rest of the world around me didn't feel that way. And so I think both at the subconscious level and at the conscious level, I developed shields against what the outside world might do should they find out that I was gay. Maybe shields isn't the right world. I, de I, I developed defenses or I developed certain sensitivities that I would know how to behave or... Be Protective coloration. As a Jew, this, well, is, this is how I, I got by in suburban New Jersey where kids were shouting Heil Hitler at me on the school bus as a little kid. So, yeah, I'm always used to just blend in as best you can. And great. Aren't kids great? Oh, oh I'm so glad one of those to hear that. Everybody talks about bullying nowadays. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's it's uh, it's always been like this. It just they'll always kids are monsters. And as a kid, you'll be a monster towards someone else, you know, in, in a little micro way. But well, kids yeah. are capable of doing some pretty crummy things. Yeah. And usually they do <clears throat> those things to feel better about themselves just for a few seconds of course you know that doesn't tend to work very well and it's kind of like junk food you're not really getting any fundamental nourishment out right. of it but you know that's not that's not gonna that's not going to probably go away anytime <laughs> so, <laughs> shitty aspects of human nature so you know again I, I write this stuff off and you know you hope kids will be better but they just get to magnify it with the internet, I guess. Um, what was the toughest part to write about in the book? It's uh, a good question. Um, two things come to mind. Oh. Um, one of them is a generalized aspect of the book. It's not something that takes up a certain yeah, number of pages, itself, but, but it's yeah. something that is, you know, throughout the book, which is we grew up with, I grew up with very little money. And in fact, when my father, um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, abandoned my mom and I, when um, I was 14 and she was in her early fifties, um, <laughs> I, I'd always had a, I think since then, an intellectual sense of the fact that we lived in poverty. Until I sat down and wrote this book, I didn't really grasp it. We had no money. And my mom, who at the time my dad left, hadn't worked in more than 20 years, uh, had no education, um, and, uh, you know, held it together and got a job as a Kelly girl, thank goodness, uh, which turned into a corporate secretarial job. Ultimately, that kept us afloat. Unfortunately, her son, me, had, you know, the terrible timing of <laughs> exploding <laughs> yeah. right, right, right while all of that was happening for her, which, which, my goodness, I look back on that now and it's like, how, how, how could I have been so blind to, to, to my mother's struggles? But again, that's, you. that's something I wanted to capture in that book. I didn't care about my mom's struggles then. That's actually another question. Mm -hmm. You convey her homemaking, you know, trying to keep the home together and her work life. Did she date or have any sort of social life? She didn't. She mine mine didn't. didn't either after my father left. So I, I reading it, I saw that might be the case or he's just, again, going from Jimmy's perspective and not understanding that his mom has a world outside of this. But, you know, my sister and I were just talking about that very matter a yeah. couple of days ago. Okay, I was and, listening in, I admit it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those smartphones these days, they're just so porous, right? Um, no, my sister and I were talking about that that very matter just the other day. And, you know, 
Gosh, this just makes me just so sad to think about it. But, um, you know, the best that we could come up with. And by the way, I mean, my sister and I, <laughs> we're, 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 we're analyzers. I mean, you know, get us at a kitchen table and it's like, you know, fast forward eight hours later and we'll have just talked about like everything. Hmm. Um, we're just talkers and processors. Um, but, you know, the best that uh, we could come up with was that, um, you know, that was yet another sacrifice that my mom made um, mm. because she, you know, uh, I think she didn't want to take the risk. I'm sure my mom was a very attractive, intelligent, poised woman, and um, surely there were opportunities for her to have a relationship with with another person um, in in her later years. And I think that she, uh, she didn't do it to, to protect me from any further disturbance, which is just, I, I can't, I tell you, I can't even allow myself to think about that because yeah. it's just like my mom's, you know, sacrifices for both of her children were profound. And if it were not for her sacrifices, I most certainly would not be sitting here across from you. Um, the other thing that was uh, hard to write about in the book, and it's strange, um, it's a it's a crucial aspect of the narrative. I, I was um, I was gay bashed when I was uh, sixteen years old, and I was very nearly nearly killed. In fact, uh, if it weren't for the man stranger who was walking his dog across from the street where me and my boyfriend were being b beaten up, um, you know, I wouldn't be alive. It's as simple as that. Or I would be brain damaged. A, a one, or, one or the other. Twenty years ago, happened to him in Ireland, and I'm, I'm his trustee fellow. now. He lives in Philadelphia. He's gay bashed by two guys and wheelchair, brain damage, etc. Still functional, but no short term Are memory. You serious? Yeah, yeah. He'll probably be listening to this episode and mad that I'm framing it like this. Um, but yeah, it's it was awful. So reading that chapter, I was wrought because we just passed the twentieth anniversary. Uh, about a week or so ago. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, we're sending love to your friend. Yeah. And, you know, I intellectually understood the idea that I'd been gay bashed. I mean, I understood it within minutes of the incident happening. But lived with it for decades. Um, and it even, um, you know, embarked on the writing of this book, the first thing that I wrote was that scene, yeah. that sequence. Um, my boyfriend and I were walking in North beach in San Francisco, beautiful neighborhood, Telegraph Hill, actually precisely. And, um, we were walking to a punk rock club on, on, um, Broadway to the Mabuhe gardens. And, um, these guys jumped out of a car and laid waste to us. And I, uh, you know, I, of course, understood all of that, and I could remember a lot of it uh, very vividly. Uh, but it wasn't until, this is going to sound strange, but it wasn't until um, I was recording the uh, audio version of this book yeah. where I realized that yeah. happened to me. Yeah. That happened. I wasn't dreaming that which is so strange it's the only thing in my life that i that i've ever felt that i've ever had that kind of experience with mm -hmm. and that was that was that was an odd moment you know a healing moment yeah though and you know I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say, oh, all that's gone away. It's a, it's a process. I was nearly killed. And, you know, it was one of the worst things, if, you know, if we, if we have to use that terminology, worst, best, that have ever happened, that's ever, that, that, that has ever happened to me. But it wasn't until saying the words out loud, reading that chapter of the book out loud, that it came up and out of me and into my consciousness. This happened. This happened. And um, that was only a couple of months ago. So I think I'm still kind of, you know, find, finding my own equilibrium with all of that. 
Yeah, it was. I imagine that was difficult writing and, and difficult reliving and recounting. But yeah, I just. Again, I'm sorry about uh, yeah, your no, friend. No, and yeah. Again, all my. All yeah, I'll, my I'll send you some information after this about him, just so you get his story and, and all that. Please, I'll get him a copy please of the book do, too, please so. do. Um, so punk rock. That's um, <laughs> to move into a different vein. What it meant for you and how that changed and became something at the time becomes something that enables you to be different, but also becomes something that's violent and, and threatening near the end of of your span. I could go with the, the, the cheap line from that that book, is punk rock dead? But you know or <laughs> from Alpha. Hey, but you know <laughs> those of us from that original tribe, one of our lines to each other is punk rock lives forever. And I don't exactly know what we mean by that, but we all kind of just say it. <laughs> yeah, but it's a secret handshake. <laughs> <laughs> what did it mean to you over the years as it you know as it moved further and further into the past as you know that scene and you know having that dovetailing with you know who you were coming out and and becoming a gay man you know i guess this has come up well at least once in in our conversation just now i had the you know i had the seren i had there was some serendipitous timing involved with my teenage years yeah. and the years covered in jimmy rosie's and one of the key components of that is that i came of age and entered teenagehood right corresponding with the first poof of punk rock mm -hmm. on American shores in California and in New York City. Um, you know, music historians can trace the roots of it just a few years prior, prior to all then. But, you know, in, in, in 1977, when I first heard about punk rock by way of, of, uh, uh, the, the TV news piece on by the sex way of a TV <laughs> news piece on the Sex Pistols, and just instantaneously, I was my jaw dropped. I was like, "What is this strange thing that I'm watching on TV? It's so disturbing and wrong, but so intriguing. I must know more. I must know more." And then I couldn't find out more because there was there was just nothing else at that point. We were we were living in in Minnesota, but then we made our way to California, and you still couldn't find out much more about this odd thing that I'd seen on television slowly and by way largely of a classmate in high school when I was still in high school, uh, a foreign exchange student. Uh, she was deeply immersed into punk rock and, and, and hand held me in, in, into the world of San Francisco punk, which I was instantaneously smitten with. It somehow... Oh, I don't know. It was just the perfect chord, literally the perfect chord. It, 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 punk rock in 1978 in San Francisco. Anyway, it was a fantastic ragtag of misfits, people who were largely bound together by this awareness or idea that, Hmm, something's not right here. Something's not right. Okay. The TV we turn on is all full of the love boat and bewitched and all these smiling families and Pepsodent commercials, but something's not right. And hey, P.S., where did the hippies go? Like, we had them around like 10 years ago, and wasn't that supposed to be the great hope of our culture, the, this great advancement? The age into, of Aquarius. Yeah. Absolutely, into a, kind of, uh, into a kind of harmony and a brotherhood, and we were all going to eat roast beets, and everything was going to be okay. And here we were in 1978, and at least for some of us, not much was okay. And... Suddenly, there you had it in San Francisco. It was just a few hundred people. It was small. It was tiny. It was scrappy. It's hard to imagine such a thing now without the benefit of social media to tell tell people who are interested in punk rock. Oh, yeah, yeah, pay attention to this show. No, it was very. It was completely, utterly grassroots, and. 
For those of us who, are, who well, I will point out that uh, just a couple of years later, the <clears throat> Hernandez brothers, the guys who do the comic Love and Rockets, uh, did point out that you could always find the Black Flag show down in L.A. by following the police helicopters. <laughs> you know, at least there was some form of like bat signal that, oh, police chopper, that's where the show is. And you'd be, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes, these are the things, right? No, it was it was it was the it was fantastic. It was this parallel universe, a kind of, you know, full technicolor Wizard of Oz that I found myself in with all sorts of like-minded folks with this great music that was happening and really interesting makers of art and just an amazing ragtag, multicultural even team of people, team, and I mean that only in the loosest sense, because no one involved in punk rock would ever think of themselves involved in a team. Yeah, it's <laughs> organized, organized by any means. So, yeah. hey, absolutely yeah. not. Absolutely yeah. not. But no, it was great fun. And, you know, it was very gay, too, back then. And it was black, and it was Hispanic, and it was Asian, and it was white guys, and it was white girls, and it was lesbians, and it was a big mix-up of the San Francisco Bay Area it was everyone you found in California then in 1978. A few years later, as I started to naturally pull away from punk rock, it was starting to become something else. And definitely there was more money afoot then back when when we were up to no good in you know, in the heart and soul of the early punk rock, the first chapter of punk rock, there was no money to be made. There were no record labels from Los Angeles that were paying attention. There were no New York magazines paying attention to what we were doing, you know, at these underground, completely illicit and forbidden punk rock clubs in San Francisco or in New York, for that matter, or in Los Angeles, for that matter. But it became something else by the late 1970s, or early 1980s. And perhaps, as I was just suggesting, it had something to do with there was more record label money afoot. But um, it became a lot more white. It became a lot more straight. It became a lot more macho. And it became something that myself and a lot of my cohorts were not interested in. It became this hardcore offensive thing that wasn't, as I see it, the kind of next logical chapter of of the hippies and all that they were up to, but instead became this uglier, uglier thing, mm. uh, which saddened a lot, a lot of us. I think over time, that kind of balanced out in that macho, swastika, uh, tattooed to your biceps version of punk rock, the sort of next or next, next chapter after I was involved with punk rock, what it became that that became diluted and that that's no longer the case. But there was a period there where, where it was a bit where it was a bit stridently macho and not particularly appealing. It reminds me a little of um, 24 hour party people, the uh, uh, the movie with uh, Steve Coogan as the record Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. And the Joy Division Great scene film. where the Joy Division crowd starts turning neo-Nazi. And it's one of those like, yeah, I don't think Ian and those guys thought that's the sort of music they were making. But all of a sudden those fans start showing up and smashing people who aren't. Absolutely. Right. That was a head scratcher for a lot of us, but yeah. I, I was just naturally pulling away at that point anyway. Yeah. The, 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 the scene, if you will, had... You were you were a teenager and you went through I don't want to say a phase but it's sort of a phase. You're yes yeah yes. The next phase is new wave and you know that's still pretty good music when when we. Oh, it's Listen great it. music. And <laughs> right. so is early punk, too. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> just right after finishing uh, uh, the book, I, I had my Alexa unit. I'm like, just play New Wave Station for me for a while. And just, just, you know, for, and mainly, you know, more pop oriented. But it was, you know, the occasional weird singles would show up. And, like, yeah, that's that's the music of my just on the cusp of teenage years. So uh, being an MTV kid, basically, I was about 11 or 12 when MTV showed up. And that was... Again, post-punk, but, you know, you still got some good, interesting, weird music before it got a little too 
corporate. I oh, guess. for sure, it was fantastic music. Yeah, you know, well, <laughs> I still was, listen to that. It my, still populates my phone. My three hundredth <laughs> episode was with. It was just a little, a little bit later. Uh, it was a guy named Gary Clark who had a band called Danny Wilson. Um, they had a song called Mary's Prayer back in 1986, and that just yes. entered my soul. And Gary and I literally danced for about five years before I finally got him on the show. And it was, <laughs> I was trying to figure out which one will I air for number 300. Then I thought, Gary Clark's music has meant more to me than almost any author or cartoonist I've read. Of course I'll use Gary for, for 300. This will be great. Um, so we had a, a fun conversation, but it was just one of those things where I was you, you realize how much that music infects you, I guess. And lyrically, things just enter your soul and, and you don't even realize that, you know, you're, you're speaking and, oh, wait, no, that's a song lyric from when I was 15 years old. <laughs> Actually, the, the chapter heads throughout this book are all commercial slogans and, and little taglines. Where did that idea come from for that? And, and what was the, the, the motivation? It's 9 p.m. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> Fly the friendly skies. <laughs> Hey, you know, I, not to be too... It's just planting liter- it within that 70s uh, absolutely, milieu? Okay. Absolutely, and I'm not to be too, you know, literary sounding here. I mean, <laughs> in fact, I wanted to intentionally strip this book, not only of, of, of the 56-year-old observant me, but I wanted to strip the book of literary finesse. And instead, I wanted to create something that was fully postmodern, like me, somebody who grew up, not only was born and raised, was an aspect of consumer culture. One of the most defining elements Culturally, in my childhood, were, was the commercials that were always on in the background in television, and thus, I thought, you know, let's let's try with these chapter um, titles. Let's use let's use TV commercial slogans. They're not all TV commercial slogans, but ninety ninety five percent of them are, and. Um, I I don't know. It just felt right. I I felt birthed. I felt in part birthed of all of that, yeah. you know, and Lucky Charms and Libby's Fruit <laughs> Cocktail and Pop Tarts and and I wanted to convey all, all all of that. That here I was not coming from, you know, the the operas of Mozart or the uh, cello of Bach or even Dickens, but instead someone who was coming from the Brady Bunch and Fruit Loops, and I wanted to convey that on the page. You know, this th- I was not a person with erudition, at least not conscientiously, nor was I exposed to aspects of finer culture when I was a 14-year-old. During the course of this book, I do put my feet out and learn more about the world of culture. And boy, I get a lot out of it. And that's actually, and it's something that I'd never thought about being a straight guy who's just a little bit younger until I watched a Fran Lebowitz documentary a couple of years ago that Scorsese did where she talked about, and it's something you experience during the time that you're in New York where you're, along with everything else that's going on, you're also culturally shepherded you know, into, you know, some other, you know, again, you're, you're brought into to certain aspects of culture. Fran's point was once AIDS hits and older gay men aren't there to kind of bring along younger gay men into opera, into ballet and things like that, you end up with a, a more shallow culture, I guess. It's her thesis. It's not not mine, but it's something I never well, thought about. Well, I don't know um, about that. That's an, yeah. that's an interesting idea. You know, one of the more potentially controversial aspects of of the book for for certain readers is that you know i you're underaged <laughs> i was under i'm i'm underage in the narrative that's that's covered in the book and i'm yeah. doing a lot of very adult things including having a somewhat deep certainly not shallow shallow intimate sexualized relationship with a man who's nearly 40 who i go off to stay with to live with in new york city as a teenager as a 15 and 16 year old and i think that you know there are a lot of readers who might not take to that idea in retrospect now 46 years i'm sorry now 40 years later i you know i remember this man steven as someone who 
showed me wonderful, wonderful, memorable things about the world, things that really had an impact and continue to have an impact on my life today. He shepherded me. He was a kind of mentor. He turned me on not only to Philip Glass, uh, an, uh, an artist, you know, in New York City, there was a great deal of recognition for Philip Glass in the, in the late 70s, late 1970s, but not so much in California. And, and, and Stephen turned me on to Philip Glass. That's something that stays with me to this day. Another thing that that Stephen did that's in fact not um, not written about in the book is he gave me a copy. Um, wow, a used copy from a year or two after, after it had been originally published of Catcher in the Rye, of the Salinger book. Mm -hmm. And I read that book within, I started it within minutes of him, of, him, of him giving it to me, and it just had this thunderbolt impact on me. Just, it was just, it was an amazing book. It still is an amazing book. Mm -hmm. every, every time I pick it up, every time I crack open the cover, it feels like a certain electricity coming out of it and, and into my body, connecting me to this book. And, you know, I wouldn't, you know, have exchanged my relationship with this man for anything in the world. I think of it as something that had a great deal of benefit for me. Is it something, and I, I, I don't mean in any moralizing way, but is it something you look at now and wonder who he was that he was having this relationship with someone who's 15, 16? Uh, that's an interesting question. And that's one of the things, you know, when I was doing that kind of scrubbing. That's, of, I assume, because it's not yeah, in there. And I assume that's part yeah, of what you would have been. Exactly. The analysis that I might lend to that, what you've just described now was certainly not something I'm, I was aware of then. But now as I look back, I think that, you know, he was somebody who himself was a teenager inside. And in fact, there really wasn't, you know, I don't, listen, I do not condone, condone yeah, relationships. Yeah, we're not going to put yeah, judgment on the I do not. The, that, the absolutely do not, okay. do not condone relationships between um the older people and, 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 and those under 18 years old, I don't, but I think, you know, now with a 56 year old's mind, I think of him as somebody who was himself a teenager. And in, in certain respects, we were very psychically aligned not to sound too California about things, but, no, but it was the seventies in California. We so, made yeah. sense to each other and yeah. the relationship had a, a fun and, and equalized dynamic. We had a good time and he showed me wonderful things about the world. And for that, I am grateful. Had you stayed in touch after? No, I, no. I, I, I didn't know if there was any story no. of what became of him or anything weird that, you know, no, okay. no, I figured we moved on ships in the night. Did you ever think you were going to be married? A, did you think it was ever going to be legal? B, did you think you were ever going to be married to someone? No, no, absolutely not. No, absolutely yeah. not. Happy about it? Or is it a weird no, marriage? I isn't think something that, we ever wanted? But I yeah. think that, you know, I go back to what I was saying earlier in our conversation about, um, you know, one of the key things that I want... One of the key messages that that I would like as the author of this book to come through to to the reader or to readers is the idea that gay is normal. It's not strange. And I think that, you know, having laws on the books in our country, in our progressive and fantastic country that is always trying to push forward toward deeper truths that there are law there are there are laws that that treat gay people people who happen to be gay as second class citizens as something less than i don't think that's right i don't think that that's that's good for anyone and i certainly don't think that's good for the for the health of the culture at large i just don't were you did you engage in in sort of 
rights protests and things along the what those being gay political for you as an act facing out i guess you know um at the time i got g- gay married um i'd been in relationship uh in a relationship with a man f- uh for 6 years and um he in fact was from another country um from brazil and after 2 years of us being together he made the decision to stay in the country uh not legally mm-hmm. and so he was out of status um simply because we couldn't be together and we very much wanted to be together and so he made this extraordinary sacrifice and it was a very difficult period uh you know it was when i was doing uh uh, the television show on Bravo, Top Chef Masters, and I was traveling a lot, and he couldn't even get on a plane for fear of, you know, being yeah. <laughs> absorbed into the system at 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 you know at airport security. I mean that 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 was a that was a kind of grand grand bad scenario, but it was there. It was a possibility, and when the 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 the, the possibility of being able to marry came along in New York state where we were then living. We, we went and got married. We actually got married about six months before it was the defense of marriage act. Yeah. The language in the defense of marriage act got, uh, changed by the Supreme court to scrub at the federal scrub from the federal level. Mm-hmm. Um, and preempt any <clears throat> state by state. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly yeah. right. And we our our timing was good. And we went public with that before the Defense of Marriage Act, before those parts of the Defense of Marriage Act got scrubbed clean. We we went public and we did interviews and we appeared in a few newspapers because it felt like the right thing to do. I'm not so much of a uh I'm more of an indirect activist rather than a direct one, yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's what I meant. You know, were you out marching at any point over the years, or is it more through example like this? And we marched, too. Yeah. And I think of this book, Jimmy Neurosis, as a kind of small way of of, uh, of continuing in that vein that comes very, very natural to me mm-hmm. anyway. Do you keep any punk memorabilia from that time? Any of your old stuff? You know, that's a... Uh, good question. I did this thing about um, nine years ago. I was uh, living in Brooklyn. I'd lived in Brooklyn in the same apartment for almost two decades. And um, I had a small collection of punk rock records, probably uh, around 35. It wasn't a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but these were records that had never been, you know, reproduced they were just one-offs created by very small companies most of um which don't exist anymore so they these were really these are what you call collector's items punk rock back then was not documented there were only a handful of records there were only a handful of photographs that were taken there were less than a handful of videos that were made of punk rock in the in 1978, for example, in California and in New York City. So yet I had these records from back then. And I don't know if this just says anything about who I am, but I we were moving. We were moving from Brooklyn back to Manhattan. And I took all of those records and I I left them on the sidewalk oh. in our place in our place in Williamsburg. And so this would have been yeah, this is like I don't know, two thousand seven, I can't remember, two thousand eight, something like that. But the amazing thing is within seconds, just as I was walking back into the building, a van pulled up and it was a husband and wife kind of this this cool hippie couple in their 40s or 50s they got out of the car and said hey are you giving away these records and i'm like yeah 
do you want them? And so they started leafing through them, and they gasped audibly <laughs> at the strangeness of these <laughs> records that they were holding. This yeah. was not like, oh, here's another Carol King. You know, here, oh, here's Tapestry again. This yeah. was like, what are, what are these strange records that we're holding? And 45s, too. There were a bunch of 45s. And they said, can we take these? And I knew, like, this was this was meant to be. And so I they drove off into the Williamsburg afternoon in their van with these <laughs> records. Records that I probably could have made a lot of money off of now. <laughs> but they found a good home. Again, we talk about balancing karma at, at the very beginning of this. That's that's. Um, I can't believe we've gotten this far without actually talking about Savor food or anything like that. Um, we'll frame it as what you're doing next. I am um, editing, writing, producing, creating a book series for Penguin Random House called World Food. Uh, Kind of an encyclopedia of food, if you will, each volume dedicated to a different place. The first two books in the series are dedicated to cities. The cities are Mexico City, where I'm living most of the time now, and Paris, two great, great eating cities. And so these books, each of the volumes, will be deep explorations into the authentic, living, vivid food cultures of those places, replete with photographs and wonderful texts and lots of recipes. Each book will have about 60, 65, 70 recipes, classic recipes that are fundamental to the cuisines of those places. It's very exciting, uh, joyous even work. What drew you to Mexico City? I've been going to Mexico City since 1980, shortly after um, the events in Jimmy Nerosi's. Um, my dad and I got back together. Yeah, it, it comes up near the end of the book. It seems like there's a reconciliation sort of in the offing. And in fact, yeah. it, it did happen just a month or two later. And my dad and I um, uh, kicked off our reconciliation with a great great three-week trip to Mexico. We drove from where he was then living to, all the way to the to southernmost Mexico, to Chiapas. And we stopped off in Mexico City for a few days in, in both directions. And immediately I was smitten. Immediately I was like, what is this fantastic jewel of a place? And so I've always been drawn to Mexico City. And so now that I'm not working in the corporate world and don't need to be going to an office in Manhattan every single day, I thought, hmm, this book series, World Food, that I'm doing, I can kind of do this from wherever I want. So why not Mexico City? And I love it there. It's just a fantastic place, and I encourage everyone to go. I could ask a whole ton about Savor, but... I'm sort of hoping you and I can get together and do this when the, the first book comes out. Maybe not in a year <laughs> or so. We'll, we'll sit down and, and go into your life, you know, uh, the next phase post Jimmy Neurosis. We'll, we'll go into, you know, a bit more of who you were and how that whole part of your, your world evolved. Um, when my appetite came back, because during the years of Jimmy Neurosis, there wasn't a lot of food going around. That was my thing. I, I noticed every <laughs> reference to food until this this big scene in New York, every reference to food was always this sort of uh, TV dinner sort of thing. And it was like, I, I kind of feel like he's, he's making little digs at who he was and who he ended up becoming. Well, but, not to be a dime store therapist here, but my dad was a great, great, great cook, a fantastic continental cook who would make things like sour broughton and duck all orange. And when he left, so did the food. And I became hostile to the idea of food, I think, for the for the years that my dad and I weren't weren't friendly to one another. And then when we got back together, then my appetite came back. And then later, in fact, that trip to Mexico kicked it off. I discovered, wow, you can really appreciate the world by exploring what it eats. What great fun that is. Were you friends with Bourdain? I knew Anthony. Yeah. I don't know if there's any relationship weirdness or anything, if I'm asking something wrong. No, no, okay. no, not at all. I, I knew yeah. him somewhat. Um, we'd been on a trip to Singapore together, a place that I love and apparently Anthony loved as well. And 
we'd we'd met each other in public a few times, so I knew him a tiny bit. But you were pursuing your own mission. This wasn't any sort of, you know, continuing the Bourdain mission in any way of, you know, understanding people by what they eat. You guys, like Newton and Leibniz, you can reach the same conclusion independently. You know, what I realized yeah. probably about 20, 25 years ago is that what you just described there, exploring the world through what it eats, is some that was that's my work that's what i've that's what i've done since the 1990s when it when it began to crystallize and i realized oh this is the work this is the core and fundamental work that i do i'll let you get back to it i'll go hit some white castle on the way home <laughs> hey kidding. white <laughs> castle is is pretty fantastic food it's all about context well i can only eat it when my wife's traveling for a couple of days because it <laughs> takes that long to get through the system <laughs> but james thanks so much for coming on the show oh thanks for having me it's been a great pleasure and thanks for your great questions And that was James Osland. His new book is Jimmy Neuroses, a memoir from Echo Press. James's website does not have a ton on it, although there's some really neat images. But if you want to go, it's jamesosland.com. And that's J-A-M-E-S-O-S-E-L-A-N-D.com. Next year, his World Food series of books will be coming out from Penguin Random House. And I'm going to hold him to that semi sort of promise to record another conversation. And I promise that one will be more food oriented. Oh, James is also on Twitter and Instagram as James Osland, all one word spelled the same way as the website, but he's not too active on either one of them, which is probably for the best. Might also be active on Facebook, but I'm not. So I don't know. And after we wrapped, I asked James, so who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, and it was very definitive, and if you want to get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The fourth quarter episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Eddie Campbell, Nora Krug, Jason Lutz, Summer Pierre, David Small, Mark Derry, Michael Gerber, Angela Himsel, Kathy B. Graham, Shahar Pinsker, and Bill Cardalopoulos. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I have all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at a hotel in Midtown Manhattan, so there's the usual George Washington Bridge toll, uh, about 12 bucks, and 30 or so for parking on 96th Street, plus $6 for the subway. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, which I also bought while I was out there, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Stephan, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You can check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a double episode featuring cartoonist James Sturm and a bonus conversation with illustrator Joe Chardello. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. 
You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, remember, tell your pals, talk about it on social media, and please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>